Hmm. All right. Looks like we're live here. Myth Vision Podcast, ladies and gentlemen, 10 things. 10. There's many more, but 10 things <laughs> Christians wish Jesus never taught. <laughs> we are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast we're going to talk about some tough stuff and uh before we do i want to give the credentials to my my guest today dr david madison welcome to myth vision how are you i'm fine thank you for inviting me I don't know why I didn't do this a long time ago, but I get so distracted with inviting this guest, that guest, and this and that. I mean, we could have been hanging out a while ago. Well, the book was not published. It was published last August. So. Yeah, but you gave it to me almost when it first got published, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I could have already had these amazing <coughs> discussions with you. <coughs> um, it, I really enjoyed the book. So before I do discuss anything about that. I want to mention that Dr. Madison has a PhD in biblical studies from Boston University. His strong interest in the Bible began during his teenage years. Growing up in rural Indiana, Indiana in a conservative Methodist home, his parents were not fundamentalist. However, his mother introduced him to liberal Protestant biblical scholarship by way of the 12 volume interpreter's Bible. Now, um, what other, just so people understand, you got your PhD, so you know a thing or two about the Bible. Is there anything else you'd like to kind of let everyone know before we continue? Well, seminaries are, um, the purpose of a seminary is to manufacture clergy. And most of the folks who go to seminary, their motivation is to become better Christians, to be able to lead churches, to be able to defend the faith. <laughs> but seminaries also have departments of critical Bible study. And that approach was really planted in my mind by my mother, who was a voracious reader. She was born in 19, 1905 in Terre Haute, Indiana. It's kind of a miracle she didn't <laughs> become a fundamentalist. <laughs> but she never graduated from college, never went to college, but she was a voracious reader all of her life. And my dad and I would watch television and my mother would retire to, her, to the bedroom to read biography, history. And she did buy that 14-volume interpreter's Bible when I was a teenager. And I began reading that. I began studying that. I, for me, it was, it was extremely interesting. It was a product of liberal Protestant scholarship. So there was no defending the Bible as the infallible word of God. It was analyzing the texts. And that approach was embedded in my brain. And so when I went away to seminary, uh, I still had that critical approach. And that's what eventually <clears throat> brought me to say, this doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's where this comes up. Okay. Yeah. So the book is 10 things Christians wish Jesus hadn't taught. I, I have it on audible. Um, I listened to it on audible, but I must tell you, you can get it in any you know, paperback, hardback, whatever. Uh, I'm driving, listening to this. I've listened to it multiple times. There is this angel, if you're an atheist, if you're if you're a Christian, uh, uh, um, an evil uh, author reading this named Seth Andrews. <laughs> but no, seriously, his voice is amazing when he reads these books. He is the one narrating it. And uh, this book is fantastic. So in the description, you can go down and get you a copy. He's told me he has way more than just 10 things that uh, look really bad in the New Testament. But um, well, yeah. Yeah. Um... On that website, you can see one tab that says 292 uh, yes. bad Jesus quotes. Um, now, when I was preparing to write the book, I reread the Gospels for the umpteenth time during my 79 years, and I built an Excel spreadsheet of, of bad Jesus quotes, and they fall into these categories about preaching about the end times, bad advice and bad theology, scary extremism, and the, the unreal Jesus of John's gospel. And I had organized these uh, sayings into these four categories. I sent my manuscript off to my publisher, a guy by the name of Tim Sledge, 
who was 30 years a Baptist preacher, a uh, minister, and he wrote the book, Goodbye Jesus. Um, but he's my editor, my publisher, and he looked at this mass of things divided into four categories, and he said, let's try, let's try 10 categories. And he came up with the title, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught. Brilliant title. <laughs> it really is. Brilliant title. I didn't know what I was going to get. And then I started listening and I was really amazed at how you put that together, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to give a lot of credit to Tim for coming up with the concept. Maybe he was influenced by my 2016 book, uh, 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief. But it turned out to be uh, a masterpiece of a title. And um, he even came up with the title, uh, with the titles of each chapter, which were brilliant as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, can I read those real quick, just so everybody sure, knows? Because sure. we're gonna, I feel like in this episode, I'd like to cover at least five, if possible, if we can even okay. get through those. Hanging out with our audience, enjoying them. If they have any questions, they could super chat them. We can have this conversation. <clears throat> But here are the 10 things, the outline for this book. And there's two additional things he mentions, but uh, I'll just name the 10. So in troublesome teachings, you talk about part one, be careful not to love too much. Don't worry about basic human needs. Never say no to a borrower. Give me everything. Remarrying after divorce is adultery. You are accountable for every word. You can do magic. I don't want everyone to understand me. <laughs> Do what I say or I will hurt you. And I will return during your lifetime. Mm. So I just want everyone to know these websites, by the way, about the author. You can go and check him out, of course, as well. Also, he runs cureforchristianity.com and he has a YouTube channel. So he has videos up. He tries to keep them under five minutes and you can go and check out all of his teachings and things he discusses on there as well. Go show him some support. Subscribe to his channel. I posted the link at the top of the chat. If you're just now tuning in, you might have missed it, but it is in the description of this video. And go to Amazon.com. You can get the book. It's on Audible. Seth Andrews does it. Or get a paperback, hardback, so you can actually see the quotes, see the text, see what's being said, which is, if you're trying to like keep it in memory, that's the best way to go. Okay. Do we want to start off with number one or should I actually ask the question first, why you wrote this? Like what motivated you to need to write this book? Well, my 2016 book, 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief. Um, the ninth chapter was what a friend we don't have in Jesus. And my focus there was, come on, folks, there's a lot of negative things in the teachings of Jesus. Aren't you paying attention? Um uh, and so then I realized, uh, I realized that there was a whole book just on this topic alone. Uh, Bad Things Jesus Taught, that's the name of the website, or as the name of the book turned out to be, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught. And believe me, that's the case, because if you approach Christians with any one of these categories and said, do you really believe that? And if you didn't tell them Jesus had said it, they would say, no, of course I don't believe that. Are you crazy? But it's right there in the teachings of Jesus. So my most common question is to the Christians, aren't you paying attention? They're taught not to pay attention. They're taught not to question, not to probe, not to let curiosity kick in. That's the approach of the church. The church is in the business of hyping Jesus, promoting its product. And they don't want people questioning that. For 1,500 years, lay people did not have access to the Bible. They couldn't read the Bible. It was only with the invention of the printing press and <clears throat> some of the advocates of the, in the Protestant Reformation who pushed to have the Bible translated into the language of the common people. So the church has had... 2,000 years of momentum in promoting what Bart Ehrman has called the ideal Jesus of the imagination. And that's what people are locked into. And wow. You, and you tell them, well, what about that verse? What about that verse? Oh, you're taking it out of context or some other. 
such excuse. When they're dodging it, this is a great point you're bringing up. When they're dodging it or making excuses, it doesn't mean hate. Come on. Yeah, well. No, like these are red flags to us <laughs> today. And you and I both were Christians. So I think it's important that we're coming from this place. We're not ignorant on understanding what it's like to be a believer, to be a Christian. Um, I know I was a radical, so you may not have been a fundamentalist like I was. I was speaking in tongues, rolling on the ground, prophesying, and then eventually moved out of that <laughs> to more Calvinist, Presbyterian, tried to be taking my Bible more seriously. But I even then I accepted hate meant hate. Jacob, I love no. Esau. I hated, but I still did not follow all of the things Jesus taught. And I had, I admit, like while I was consistent in some ways as a Calvinist to try and like let ugly things be true in the Bible, there were some things I wasn't willing to like that you discuss in this book that I was like, no, he doesn't want you to hate your mother and your father if if they're not in the kingdom and like th th this fictive kinship of being in the kingdom is more important than your biological ties. No, 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 no. So. Well, people, again, people are just, so many Christians are not aware. Um, I tell the story in the book of the Catholic woman I happened to have an encounter with. And she was going on and on and on about her wonderful Savior, Jesus, and on and on and on about her wonderful church. And so I, my, um, uh, <laughs> my more confrontational self came to the surface and I said what about Luke 14 26 blank stare well let me quote it for you whoever comes to me and does not hate father mother family etc etc and even life itself cannot be my disciple what was her reaction she flamed out she got angry obviously I was lying there could be no such text I was making it up it's right there. The Greek word for hate is right there. Hector Avalos has a 39-page chapter in his book, The Bad Jesus, just about this verse. You can't escape it. That's what it means. Well, Jesus couldn't have meant that based upon your ideal image of Jesus. But then the next question is, why would Luke report that he said it? Luke quotes Jesus saying that. And then you, then you had to look at the context. What is the context for that? <clears throat> Earlier in the 14th chapter of Luke, Jesus tells the parable of the great banquet. A wealthy man invited a lot of people to a, a banquet. He wanted his table full. At the last minute, he got a lot of excuses. Nobody could attend. So the host sent, he sent his servants, his slaves, out into the city, to the, to the lanes, the highways, Invite the lame, the crippled, the blind, the poor. I want my table filled. Hey, that's a great parable. That, that's a splendid parable. But I think Luke was saying, whether that parable go, goes back to Jesus or not, we have no way whatever of telling. Right. But Luke was saying, well, just a minute, we don't care your social status. That doesn't mean anything to us at all. But if you're going to join this organization, if you're going to join this cult, this sect, then this is where your loyalty has to be above all. We don't want divided loyalties. We don't want anybody being more devoted to family than to us. And that's the way cults always operate. Yeah. And Jehovah's so the, Witnesses still do it. <clears throat> and that's... I think the point, the Luke, the point that Luke was trying to make. Well put, well put. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll start getting into the number one. We'll talk about number one, but first, I've got a super chat. So, when a, when an audience member, I don't know if you've done <coughs> this before, but when an audience member sends a super chat, I address it. You and me hang out. We talk about them for a moment and what they say. You may have some a lot to say about it, may not have a lot to say about it, whatever, and then we'll keep focusing on the content and our audience can interact that way. Perfect. So first one is by a friend. Stop scamming, man. Thank you for the super chat and being here today on a blessed good Friday. Cause gosh, goodness, it's good. It's good day. And it <laughs> Hega Sippa said, James brother of Jesus never bathed Jesus in Mark seven in response to criticism, his disciple didn't wash before eating. 
Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. <laughs> well, do you have anything about the whole, this whole nothing that enters a man uh, is unclean, but what comes out is what defiles? Do you think, what do you think is going on with that? Gee, you would think that the, uh, this member of the Trinity, this member of God Almighty, would know that's not true. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Tim Sledge earlier, my editor publisher. He wrote a book called Four Disturbing Questions uh, with one simple answer. And one of his questions, one of his four disturbing questions is, why didn't God tell us about germs? We've got a 1,000-page book inspired by God. <clears throat> why wasn't there a chapter on microbes? Why wasn't there a chapter on germs? Jesus here, here says something is plainly, plainly wrong. The things that go into us can defile us. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple. Yeah, and I, I don't know what he's... That's the thing. Like People will go, well, what did he mean by that? He meant something different than the idea that it's going to possibly poison you or whatever. Oh, wait I a mean, minute. Wait a minute. I say, how do you know what was going on in the mind of Jesus? Right. How do you know that? That's the basic question to ask of any of this stuff. How do you, that parable that Jesus told, that Jesus told, how do you know it came from Jesus? That goes back to the fundamental question about everything reported that Jesus said in the Gospels. There is no contemporaneous, contemporaneous documentation, whatever, for anything Jesus said, taught, did. And by contemporaneous, contemporaneous documentation, we mean letters, diaries, transcriptions, court records, Anything. newspaper accounts uh, in later eras. If you want to report something that Abraham Lincoln said or George Washington, what do scholars do? They go to the archives. They go to the libraries. They find the letters, the diaries, documentation, transcripts, court records to back up what they are going to claim Washington or Jefferson or, or Lincoln said. None of that exists for Jesus. The Gospels were written decades later, and we don't know their sources. Thank you. Thank you. He's back again. Stop scamming, man. <clears throat> thank you for that super chat, my friend. Mark 3, when his family heard, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Jesus shrugs this off, saying his followers are his mothers and brothers. So much for <laughs> Marianism. I, I love it. That you know that falls into the category of uh, be careful not to love too much. This is also a, an example of cult fanaticism. That's perfect for because our number one is to be careful not to love too much. That's your first chapter. So, yeah, uh, but on my original list of four, this fell, falls into the category of cult fanaticism. Um, the people who who follow the kingdom of God are my brothers and sisters, not his birth family. That is another mark of cult fanaticism. Mm. It's like the guy who uh, said, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me first go home and bury my father. Jesus said, no, follow me now. Let the dead bury their dead. Even as a kid, I thought that was a stupid thing to say. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you, you paint it in the book in a way where you're like, I think you give a modern example where you're like, I mean, imagine if your loved one, your dad actually dies hmm. and or mother, whoever it might be, and you're going to need to go and have a funeral for them. He's such a fanatic and it seems apocalyptic in his thinking that it's like, nah, let the, don't even worry. They're dead. It's done. Let the dead bury the dead. whoop de doo You know, you need to focus on the kingdom and that's it. Yeah. And of course, religious fanatics know what the kingdom means. They have that idea embedded in their mind. And the gospel of Mark, for example, the message in the gospel of Mark is not about great moral teaching. The message of the gospel of Mark is about the kingdom is about to be here. Get ready for it. Mm -hmm. Get ready for it. At his trial, um, 
at the trial of Jesus in Mark 14, I believe it is, Jesus says, you, he's addressing the people in the trial, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Gosh, that never happened, did it? Mm -mm. That audience did not see that happen. This was Mark's theology, and Mark was wrong. That statement has abundantly been abundantly falsified by the way history unfolded. If you told the author of Mark, guess what, 2,000 years from now, some fanatical Christians will still be looking for Jesus on the clouds, Mark would have been flabbergasted. That wasn't his theology 2,000 years from now. He was looking for something very immediate, as was the Apostle Paul. Exactly. Yeah, this is a great point you bring up. <clears throat> in, in, in that notion of how Christians will ignore certain harsh teachings, but remember certain ones that favor what they're comfortable with doing. Yeah, exactly. I find the same problem in, you talk about this in your chapter 10, which we'll get to uh, the whole, I will return during your lifetime, but there, this ig ignoring what it's plainly saying in order to make it about today. But notice, this is something interesting. I just want to make mention the Jehovah's witnesses and cults like that, how they still, they hear the language of the text and they read it into now, even like as if this still is something that they're waiting for. I just find it quite ironic how they, how I used to do it too. I thought the second coming was coming soon. I never knew to pay attention closely to when this was actually supposed to happen. So <laughs> we'll get, we'll get to that. I'm sure more in depth. I've got one more here. Doc Pleromanot. Thank you. Good to see you in the chat. Was the Johannine lie in John 7.10 justified even in Greco-Roman noble texts? Seems later scribes were certainly uncomfortable by changing not to not yet. Do I need to pull the text up? Yep. <laughs> I don't have the Gospel of John memorized. I am. Yeah, no biggie. No biggie. You definitely know your Bible, though. Let me get um, John 7.10. Verse 10, and I'll read it. This is the ESV. So Doc is uh, into, like, he knows the language and stuff too. So, uh, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So let me see. Was the Johannine lie in John 7 10 justified, even in Greco Roman noble context? Hmm. Seems later, scribes were certainly uncomfortable by changing not to not yet. I don't know if I have my translations just not showing what John 7, 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up not publicly, but in private. Oh, you remember how he said, I'm not going. He says uh, in verse eight, you go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast oh. for my time has not yet come, fully come. Then two verses later, but after his brothers had left, you know, to go to the feast, he also went up not publicly, but in private. Mm. So he like told him, I'm not going, but he still goes. He doesn't want them to know he's going or something. Uh, my time has not come. All right, they're gone. I'm going to go check it out. Like, I don't know. Well, but first of all, you've got to appreciate that nothing in the Gospel of John is history. Richard Carrier has said of John, the author of the fourth gospel, he is lying. He's making things up. He's a novelist. Above all, above all, the four gospel writers, John is guilty of what I call theology inflation. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, who knows where his ideas came from and what his imagination was, was creating. That's, you know... <clears throat> And of course, there's a problem, and I'll also get into this later. We don't have the original text of any of the Gospels. We have copies of copies of copies of copies. The first full New Testament dates from the 4th century. Uh, so when you look at any particular verse and say, you know, how has the text been messed with or changed or altered by scribes? We don't know. Hmm. Thank you, Doc, for the super chat. I don't know if we quite tackled your very, very specific uh, question, but um, it's an interesting section to look at. So getting back to the book, 
be careful not to love too much. Did we, is there anything we didn't touch on in this area of not be careful not to love too much? This isn't just about relationships with family, friends, but isn't this even deeper about not to even love this life? Like, like don't well, love anything other well, than, that, yeah. That, that, that comes up in Luke 14, 26, unless you hate your life itself. That certainly is cult fanaticism. Uh, the God of our cult wants everything. Wants your full devotion. No questions asked. No divided loyalties. That's dangerous stuff. And it's right there in the New Testament. So I keep saying, please read the Bible. <laughs> Isn't that what the, the cure for Christianity.com? You, you talk about the number well, one thing. Well, that's based upon Mark Twain's famous quote. The best cure for Christianity is reading the Bible. Mm. And now, of course, with more than 500 titles on that cure for Christianity library, there's a lot more books to help with that. But also, I forget what, I forget where <laughs> where it is. Again, I don't have it memorized. But when Jesus sends his disciples out to preach in the towns and villages, and he says, if anybody doesn't want to hear your message, knock the dust off your shoes and move on. On the day of judgment, it'll be worse for that town than Sodom and Gomorrah. Really? I, I've given this example before, but if a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon missionary knocks on your door <clears throat> and you say, I'm not interested, get lost, go away. Whether you say it nicely, politely, or just get lost. And about 20 paces away, the guy turns around and says, just you wait, God's going to burn your house down. You'd say, what a nut job. What a crazy, what a loony. But that's what Jesus is saying. <laughs> if people if people don't want to hear you on the day of judgment, their fate will be the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned to the ground. I've interviewed XJWs, X, <laughs> XJWs who actually say that. They told me, like, uh, one of my friends who has a YouTube channel called The Truth Hurts, he's left, right? He's full-blown apostate. And he's very open on his channel about the things they used to talk about. Him and his friends would go on these little missions to go out there and try and preach. And when they would say no or they were antagonistic or even just, I'm sorry, no, they would walk away about talking about how, did you see the demons in their eyes? Weird conversations mm -hmm. like that. And then the other thing was in the kingdom to come, when they're annihilated and killed by God, I'm going to take their property. Their property is going <laughs> to be mine. I'm not making this up. This is the kind of mindset that they had. He does videos about this and he talks about how we used to talk about their lot, their property is going to get divided and it's going to be ours and they're going to be tortured because they're um, not in the kingdom. My article on the debunking Christianity blog last Friday was the title of it was is I got a letter from a Jehovah's witness. I'd been away on a holiday for a couple of weeks and I got back and there was a big pile of mail. And here was an envelope for all the world. It looked like it was from a personal friend. Return address was from Virginia. I won't say her last name uh, in Pauling, New York. The postmark was California. I thought, well, that's strange. But it was just a simple one page letter. And it was explaining it was an explanation of why we suffer. Why there's so much suffering in the world? It's because we have not we have disrespected God's holy name. So the title of the article was I got a letter from a Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but the subtitle was about what a big pile of bad theology this letter was. Mm. I mean, is that really the kind of God you want? who's going to ignore such massive human suffering because his name has not been held in sufficient sanctity? Do you really want a God with that much ego, that much wounded pride? Bad theology.
again, that's on the Debunking Christianity blog. Uh, that's just www.debunkingchristianity.com. You have so I should have gotten a list of your websites before. <laughs> well, that's not my website. That okay, belongs, that belongs to John Loftus. Okay, debunkingchristianity.com. Com. Um, in the chat. So everybody... when when my 2016 book was published, John invited me to write for the Debunking Christianity blog, and I fell into the habit. I fell into the practice of writing an article and publishing it every Friday. Um, and I think the one I published this morning was the 292nd article I've published there since 2016. Yeah. Just so they know, um, it's debunking-christianity.com because I did debunkingchristianity.com and it didn't come up. So there it is in the chat, just so everybody knows. You can go check that out and uh, see what he's published over there. One thing I would like to say before we move on to chapter two and get another super chat here is if we're going to be honest about who seems to be more biblical, these cults that I actually am speaking against on my channel and having people who've left them from radical fundamentalist evangelical groups that we would, you know, be giving a thumbs up to when we were Christians back in the day, in some sense, to cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, you name it. Um, it seems that if I'm just using the JWs, for example, they're more biblical to Jesus' words mm -hmm. than what we're finding other Christians, the mo majority of Christians on planet Earth are. Most Christians, to cling to the Christianity that they love and adore, like that Catholic woman I was talking with, they are clinging to the ideal Jesus of the imagination as promoted by priests, preachers, ministers, Sunday school teachers. I call all these characters paid propagandists. That's what they are. What Catholic priest is going to stand up on a Sunday morning and advocate for Mormonism from the Catholic uh, altar? They're not going to do it. They are paid. They're trained to advocate for their version of Christianity. Right. Um, and, and many Catholics have told me this. They were never encouraged to read the Bible. That just wasn't part of Catholic practice. And that's why they're able to get the, the Catholic Church is able to get away with with the ideal Jesus of the imagination as they portray him. Um, hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, it <laughs> Stop scamming man is back. Believers turned atheist never run with the logic of one should worship their creator. If they did, they would proceed to worship those who turned out to be their real creators, mom and dad. <laughs> I appreciate that. Stop scamming, man. Um, Doc Pleromonot, thank you again. As an animal lover, did those Goddarine swine really, des <laughs> uh, really deserve their fate and the ruin of they that kept them? Peta would have had a filled day with this maniac. <laughs> well, <clears throat> excuse me. That's a reference to the fifth chapter of Mark, where a, uh, if you want to put a 20th century spin on it, a mentally ill man comes to meet Jesus. But in that time frame, in that mindset, it's not mental illness, it's demon possession. Right. Jesus and the demon are part of the same spiritual realm. And therefore, the demon knows who Jesus is. What have you to do with me, son of man? And we're not told the magic spell that Jesus used, but he transfers these demons into a herd of 2,000 pigs. And the pigs run off a cliff and they drowned in the sea. And guess what? The local people got together and they said to Jesus, please leave. <laughs> he... he you know, Jesus has destroyed this man's livelihood. Um, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story, of course, is that the spiritual power of Jesus far exceeds the spiritual power of a demon. Um, but um, 
Yeah. Can you imagine someone doing that today in the whole town? <laughs> we get out of here, man. We don't want that. Um, Scott Duke, thank you for the super chat. Please take a moment and reflect on the late Dr. Avalos contributions and corrections to New Testament studies. I do have something that I've mentioned maybe way in the past. Um, I would say, well, a few weeks before Dr. Avalos actually passed away, I emailed him. I, I just, I'm new on the scene with Myth Vision. Um, this new kid on the block who's excited about this information. People were telling me about him. So I emailed him. He wrote me back and he said, my voice doesn't work anymore or something wow. like he said it was so far in and he said, I'll be dead anytime now. I really mm. wish I could come on your show wow. to talk about these things. Cause even now, like at the brink of death that, uh, I, I, I still have this inside me. It's almost like that Jeremiah thing, the, the fire within my bones, you know, to get this out, to teach people, to wake people up, to make them realize how harmful some of these teachings really are or how neglected they are by people who claim to be followers of this stuff. Like, sure, your version of Christianity, you can paint it in a way that's not harmful. Go for it, whatever. Mm. Why, why do you need it then? I mean, why are you taking half of it and throwing it away and keeping only half of it on the moral teachings you think are okay and you're willing to follow. So, sorry. Uh, Dr. Avalos, would you like to comment about? Well, <clears throat> one of his classic books is The Bad Jesus. And he he has quite a few chapters discussing the very concepts that, that we're talking about here. And, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a 39-page chapter in there just on Luke 14:26. It means what it seems to mean. The Greek word hate is right there. But he also deals with the Christian apologists who dance around this and try countless ways to get around the clear meaning of the text. Mm -hmm. um, but his other great book is um, The End of Biblical Studies, in which he argues, you know, in the modern world, we don't need biblical studies anymore. We don't need people who are... Uh, still trying to argue that the Bible has relevance for modern life. It doesn't. It's it's a document from so long ago and preserves so many horrible concepts. He, he was a phenomenal contributor to, uh, to biblical studies. I recommend those two books highly. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll always remember him. Thank you for taking the time to mention uh, Dr. Avalos too. Um, we'll press into chapter two. Don't worry about basic human needs. What, what, what were you thinking when you wrote this chapter? <clears throat> well, I was thinking that, um, you know, in the beginning of the book, I talk about how dare I talk about things Christians, as if I knew what Christians wish Jesus hadn't taught. But let's look at it. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about food. God gives food to the birds of the air. <clears throat> God clothes the lilies, clothes the lilies of the field. Don't worry about your clothing. I personally don't know any Christians who take that seriously. I know plenty of Christian women, not to, you know. I may be on dangerous ground here, but I know that so many Christian women are, are extremely concerned about, are they fashion conscious? Are they, are they wearing the right things? Are they wearing the right style? Uh, they do worry about those sorts of things, as do the men, of course. Um, do not store up treasures for yourself on, on earth. Store up treasure for yourself in heaven. There have probably have been a few thousand sermons preached on exactly what that means to store up treasure for yourself in heaven. And so I would ask any Christian with a pension plan, are you following this? Do not store up treasure for yourself on earth. Isn't that what having a pension plan is all about? This is a kind of unrealistic approach to life that makes sense if you're an apocalyptic prophet. Right. If you believe the kingdom of God is just around the corner, why worry about clothes? Why worry about food? Why worry about storing up treasures for yourself on earth? 
all that's going to be irrelevant when the kingdom arrives and the king is going to come soon. Jesus is going to descend through the clouds. The earliest document in the New Testament is Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. We call it First Thessalonians because it's commonly felt now that Second Th Thessalonians is a forgery. <clears throat> but in the fourth chapter of First, First Thessalonians, Paul is trying to reassure members of that congregation who are worried. They had they had relatives, Christian relatives, who have died. They're going to lose out on the kingdom. Paul says, not at all. The dead in Christ are going to rise first to meet Jesus in the air. And he says, I'll be with you. I'll be able to join you there in the air. It's also going to be musical accompaniment, uh, God's trumpet. Um, and he says, like, uh, uh, we will be, and we, talking about him included, which is the <laughs> point I think Christians don't realize, like, Paul's talking about him in this. It's like yes, yes. he's going to be alive and transformed. Like it's going to happen out of nowhere. Like you said, the trumpet's going to happen. So that first person, you know, they just don't see that Paul's thinking this is him, that it's going to happen mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago. So, Well, there's so much urgency in Paul's writing about when it's going to happen. Married people should stop acting as married people do that. Stop having sex. You want to be pure for the arrival of Jesus. Why are you Christians taking one another to court? One of these days, you're going to be judging angels. Aren't you capable of judging one another? Paul, for Paul, it was immediate. And there have been plenty of studies now about how Mark seems to have been heavily influenced by the theology of Paul. Um, so this immediate apocalypticism is right there in the letters of Paul and in the Synoptic Gospels especially. Mm. I have Christians that uh, will post on my channel all the time. I don't know if they're doing it because they're like trying to convince me to come back. You know how it is. Sometimes they'll post things to try to get your attention. But they're like, uh, thank you for this video. And the video is like literally a video showing why something isn't true about Christianity. They're like, thank you for this video. It strengthened my faith even more. I lost <laughs> out on a job. I'm not even kidding. Like, this is the stuff that they do. Uh, I lost out on a job recently and I'm going through a really tough time. This video actually strengthened my faith. Thank you so much for this video. And I'm like, what is this? Is it like a triggering response that they're doing this? And then they say, I know that I'm like, all my needs are going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about anything. And I hope they don't take that too literal. I think that they mean that, like, okay look, it's okay. I'll find another job. Like I'll work in paid to take care of my kids somehow. Like there's some way of responsibility. And my dad used to teach me these things growing up too. Cause I was such a radical Christian who believed like I, if I have enough faith, I can get whatever I really want. If, if I ask my father for bread, he'll give it to me. He's not going to give me a stone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And my dad would go, son, if you go lock yourself in that closet and you prayed hard enough for a hot dog or whatever to stay alive, and you don't leave that closet, you are going to die, son. Just so you know, you are going to die. And um, I always used to fight that. No, no, no. I had like, I thought I could, that God could intervene and actually bring a food for me if I just prayed enough and stayed in the closet. But no, like, um, that seems to be kind of this idea that there's magical uh, powers that are involved. We're going to get to that, but that's in the next episode. That's going to be number seven. So, um, Anyway, is there anything else about don't worry about our basic human needs that you'd like to discuss? No, it's just the, it's a basic, it falls into that category of bad advice and bad theology. Um, most Christians just don't take this kind of thing seriously. That's not the way they live. That's not the way they function in the world. And by the way, um, when my book was, my 2016 book was published, 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief, it has a Facebook page too. And I got in the habit of doing a weekly, a weekend boost, a paid boost on Facebook um, to get that Facebook page in front of more people. And I carefully selected the target audience, secular, atheist, uh, non-believer. It always ended up on Christian news feeds, Facebook feeds. And oh my goodness, the amount of hate 
the, the venom, the hatred the, the, that these Christians commented on the book. Not a clue that any of them had read it or entertained or tried to engage in the issues I was raising. Right. They just, it was just full of venom. It was like when Christopher Hitchens died and they found out for the first time the, the title of his book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. There was a huge out, outflowing of Christian hate on the internet toward Christopher Hitchens. They'd never heard of the book, but just the title was enough to, you know, provoke this tide of, of hate. Ooh. Did you ever watch that YouTube video Richard Dawkins did where he talks about Christian love letters? It's a joke. Oh, yes, I had <laughs> a long time ago. I saw that. <laughs> he, he did something so magical with that video and he's reading. <laughs> you must be uh, what did he call him? You're a gaytheist or something like, 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 mm -hmm. what is this guy thinking? And then he's like, I can't wait to watch you cook in God's broth from my watchtower in heaven. Like what, how can you come up with this? Well, you know, is, is there something in Jesus that might reflect that kind of thinking about damnation and being cast into outer darkness and kind of showing enough is enough mentality. And that Christians have this idea of teaching from Jesus, you know, Christians will say like, that's not Christian to say those things, right? The ones who want to try and say, look, those people aren't acting Christian. But once again, are the Jehovah's Witnesses acting Christian by disowning their own family, by sticking with the cult or sticking with their kingdom that they believe their message is true? They're being more Christian-like than those who aren't. If you're well, if you're going with the words of Jesus, you know what I mean? Uh, the article that I published this morning on the Debunking Christianity blog, maybe Jesus himself can talk you out of Christianity. <clears throat> there I talk about the... <laughs> The Old Testament God didn't have a hell. He was willing to really beat up on his chosen people, really make them suffer. Uh, or if you bowed down to another God, you were in serious trouble. But there was never really eternal punishment involved. That comes along with the New Testament. That comes from ideas that were absorbed into Judaism in the intertestamental period. And, and now you have Jesus talking about fire and eternal punishment. And hell, uh, the 25th chapter of Matthew is so often quoted. When did we see you hungry and, not, and feed you? When did we see you in prison and visit you, et cetera, et cetera? When you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. That's a beautiful part of the chapter. But then, if you didn't feed the poor, if you didn't give... Uh, drink to the thirsty, if you didn't visit those in prison, etc., etc., you are cast into outer darkness, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You get to go to eternal punishment for failing to be compassionate enough. I also point out in the article this morning about there's the text uh, where Peter says, do you, do I have to give forgive somebody seven times. And Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven. Hey, that's a beautiful teaching. Forgiveness. Um, abundant forgiveness. But wait a minute. Jesus himself says that God doesn't have to fulfill that level of abundant forgiveness. You don't listen to my preachers, I'm going to burn your house down. You're, on the day of judgment, you're going to be held accountable for every careless word you utter. Why is he not forgiving them for that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you fail to be compassionate enough? Never mind. Into hell with you. There's too much incoherence here. There's too much tension. <clears throat> because people want to say, well, there may be these negative things that Jesus said. But he said so many nice things, too. But they really don't cancel each other out. The negatives about Jesus are in full view in the Gospels. That's just the truth. you got to deal with it. Yeah, well, saw, they don't deal with it. No, yeah, they don't. There's there's a meme, actually, that I saw. Like, you know how they have memes on Facebook and stuff? And it was uh, one on an XJW site that I'm on on Facebook. I actually was just now scanning to see if I could find it. There's a, there's a person 
who's like, all right, forgive you. He forgave him the 490th time. And then the next still image is 491. And he's throwing the guy like, <laughs> like throwing him. So he's like, ah, it's been 491 times. That's it. Uh, just making kind of a funny about the whole issue. So yeah, it's interesting how when you put the morals onto God, it's that euthyphro issue, you know, uh, that comes up is God like, does he hold to the same standards as us? And should we, the clay, the pottery, the, 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 the vessel that's whatever God wants it to be. Cause we're nothing. Remember we're dung. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Like we're nothing. I mean, that, that's how we're, you're projected in this world by this ideology. And how can you judge God? How can you sit here and make these standards? And mm -hmm. it finally came to a point in my own life where I realized, I said, because I was a Calvinist. And you know the implication is, did God predestine people for hell? I came to try swallowing that pill and <laughs> was saying yes with my mouth. But I don't think I quite really grasped the issue. And when I looked at some of my loved ones and thought, are they going to hell? That's when I went, am I more like, do I love them more than God loves them? Hmm. Because Jacob, I loved Esau. I hated, I accepted the words. The text says, well, God loves Esau too, but he hated him at the same time. Get out of here. <laughs> Jacob. I loved Esau. I hated show me a text where Esau. I loved doesn't show that it shows that he hates him. I accepted this for what it said and realized, well, are there people in this world that I love and really care about that God hates? And does that mean I'm more moral than God? And that was a real question I had. So anyway, uh, Keith, Pennsylvania, thank you for the super chat. When did Satan become a bad guy to Christians? Hmm. Damn if I know. <laughs> yeah, I would say sometime in Second Temple, sometime during Second Temple theology, uh, I would say there's a shift from him just being the pit pool of God who does God's wishes and whatnot to becoming an entity, kind of a dualistic entity fighting against God and not just doing the bid of God. Uh, but the I theological still... problem of the devil, Satan, is huge. Why would God tolerate an adversary? God is all powerful. Why would God tolerate <clears throat> the existence of an adversary in the spiritual realm for a, for a second? <clears throat> you know, I also tell, this is part of the whole concept of Christians. Please pay attention to the Bible. Please read the Gospels carefully. In the Gospel of Mark, after the, but, but, uh, Jesus is baptized, the Spirit drives him into the wilderness and he is tested by Satan. Two verses. That's it. Matthew comes along and makes it into a 10 or 12 verse story. And he invents, invents a conversation between Jesus and the devil. Now, anybody who has any instincts for accurate history would want to know who was there taking notes. How do they know this conversation between Jesus and the devil? And some might say, well, Jesus told his disciples later. Yeah. Where's the notes? Unless, you, unless the disciples wrote these things down, contemporaneous documentation, the Gospels are not history. They just aren't. Especially since, since we know that the Gospel writers depended heavily on the uh, on the Old Testament, uh, on their imaginations. And Dennis McDonald has shown to what degree the gospel writers relied on Greek mythology. Um, there were a lot of streams that came together in the creation of the gospels. And writing history was their least concern. They just weren't. I'm so glad you mentioned Dennis. I love Dennis. <laughs> His stuff is awesome. Yes. Well put. Like, how did they know he's praying in the garden when all of them are asleep? <laughs> oh, there were other ones there. Uh, like, oh, the text says they're all passed out and only Jesus is there having this conversation. But there's, it's like the cameraman. It's over here in the corner. And you're like, who's behind that camera? Uh oh, my light just went up. Hold on one second. Sorry. <clears throat> hmm. 
my apologies. The spirits were angry at me for uh, <laughs> this uh, here. So anyway, um, next one. And then uh, we'll be wrapping up here soon. So don't worry. Uh, this is amazing. The time is flying. My fave is the brat couldn't get mom to get booze for the boys. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. What have to do with thee? Or what have I to do with thee? John 3, 4. So, Doc, thank you for the super chat. That's his favorite part. It's like, hey, uh, they ran out of wine. And she's like, so what? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to comment on it? Well, uh, wasn't it the Greek god Bacchus who also transferred transformed water into wine? And I just said, uh, I just saw on Facebook today, why would they kill anybody who could transform water into wine? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you would think they'd go, hold on, we need more wine. Like, don't kill that guy. He's good. He's good. Um, but, yeah, Bacchus or Dionysus is saying. But that's the. Um, that's one of the miracles in John's gospel that's found nowhere else. I mean, right. the challenge, I, <laughs> I'd like to issue this challenge to Christians. When's the last time you heard a Christian say, I'm going to go home tonight and binge read the gospels. They might binge, binge watch their television program, but my challenge to Christians, read the gospel of Mark straight through without stopping. It takes about as much time as watching a movie. Take a break, have a big glass of wine. Trust me, you'll need the wine. And do the same thing with the Gospel of John. Without stopping, read the whole thing. And you have to say, what's going on here? These are two different characters. John's, again, I accuse John of, of theological inflation. Uh, so much, so much in the Gospel of John just isn't in the other Gospels. How do the other Gospel writers miss the resurrection of Lazarus, the changing water into wine? How do the other Gospels authors miss these huge Jesus monologues that are in John and nowhere else? Randall Helms has said in his book, Gospel Fictions, the Gospels, they all were they wrote novels. And uh, by the time John came along, he he was really skilled at putting the, his theology inflation into story form. Um, and, and here's a good example of why we can't trust the Bible text. The eighth chapter of John about the woman taken in adultery. He who was without sin throw the first stone. That text wasn't, isn't in the earliest manuscripts of John's gospel. It was added later. In fact, in some manuscripts, it appears in, in the gospel of Luke. We have no idea where the story came from. We have no idea whether, it's, whether it derives from Jesus or whether somebody just made it up. <clears throat> but there it is. That's the way the guy... Why, if God inspired the Bible, didn't he inspire the protection of the text? Yeah. That, was Bart, that was Bart Ehrman's question when he got into deep into Bible study. I mean, he's the textual critic. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy looks at every source, early source. He sees this issue. And yes, I'm with you. But even then, uh, yeah, there's so many, so many issues. All right, we'll get to number three. Never say no to a borrower. Was someone asking you for money this day? And you're like, hey, listen, man, I'm not Jesus, okay? <laughs> um, never say no to a borrower. <clears throat> if anyone begs from you, don't refuse them. Uh, if anyone sues you, <clears throat> give them more than you've been sued for. And now, based upon my knowledge of Christians serving two parishes, and uh, although it was a long time ago, and the Christians I know in my life now, none of these rules do they take seriously. Give, you know, always, <clears throat> always lend to those who want to borrow from you. Um, always give to someone who's begging. When someone sues, give more than you're being sued for. This falls into that category of bad advice and bad theology. May sound nice, 
but no Christian will. <clears throat> no Christian will say, well, that's the way I lead my life. That's the way I get along daily in the world. Truly, 10 things Christians wish Jesus hadn't taught. But, you know. So, if I may in this, yes. this is the money, this is giving money, okay? We see an example in Acts where they're really giving what they're supposed to with the example <laughs> of killing the two people because the Holy Spirit wasn't happy that they kept a little bit of money for themselves. Oh, 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 strike them dead and they die. And none of the disciples were like, Hey God, chill. No, they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, die. Ananias, isn't it Ananias and Sapphira or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end of that episode, <clears throat> it said this struck terror into the whole church to make them give, to make sure everybody's okay. giving. That's that's the purpose of the cult of any cult. And you can go back to the saying of Jesus, you should love your the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. All, all, all. That may look good in stained glass, but I don't know of any Christian who follows that. There may be, <clears throat> there are Christians who retire to a, a monastic life and try to aim for that. But ordinary, everyday Christians who are who are making their way in the world they know that's not their attitude toward God. All, all, all. And the, the narrative version of that is indeed in Acts 5, mm -hmm. when Ananias and Sapphira sell a field and they don't give all, all the money to the church. And St. Peter, are you sure you want to use the word saint there? Peter says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Ananias drops dead. A few hours later, Sapphira comes in and he challenges her. She drops dead. What's the point of this story? It struck terror into all who heard it. Luke, probably the author of Acts as well as the Gospel Luke, these are cult propagandists. They are trying to advance the cause of their chosen cult. One of so many in the ancient world. One of a few, by the way, who believed in a dying, rising Savior God. <coughs> Excuse my voice giving up. But that, that Christianity is borrowed. It's borrowed from other faiths, from other cults, other religions, other sects. But it was the one that... Um, that happened to dodge all the right bullets, as Richard Carrier said. It, it was the one. It didn't take a miracle for Christianity to succeed. It uh, it dodged all the right bullets and and made its way forward. In that chapter, never say no to a borrower. Um, is this also in the vein of, cause that's specifically money I wanted to bring up, but is this in the vein of turn the other cheek, go the extra mile? Like, that or is that give me everything chapter four? I can't remember, but either way, they kind of go together, don't they? In a way, <clears throat> repeat what you just last said. Um, so you know, go the extra mile, mm -hmm. um, obviously was a literal task that Romans mm -hmm. would make you mm -hmm. walk a mile carrying mm -hmm. their rucksack, so to speak. Um, and to you're supposed to go, cheek. yeah, and then turn the other cheek ideas. Oh, don't resist an evil one. Don't resist an evildoer. <clears throat> How horrible the world would be if, if, if we really followed through on that idea. Don't resist an evil one. What? That's the way human civilization has advanced because we really try to put down, we try to resist evil people. Um, and Martin Luther King and his nonviolent uh activism he was certainly trying to resist evil so it's one of those bible texts that just is too incoherent to take seriously 
It really is. Yeah, if he's makes you wonder <laughs> how how literal do you want to take that? Is he when they went to stone him? Are they is he escaping them? Why didn't you just let him stone him the first time they tried to stone him? Is he resisting them? Is that called resistance, or is it better to show the example? Look, let him kill you. Just let him kill you anyways. Like, you know, this kind of pacifistic approach. I don't know because it gets complicated. There are some people who even think the real history was Jesus was like an insurrectionist, but that these teachings come from more philosophers. Like you talked about borrowing, that they had put words that were pretty and fancy into the mouth of Jesus. But the apocalyptic stuff for me, your book highlighted many reasons to think that this would go back to a Jim Jones type figure. Mm. You know, I, I, I just, that's how I keep looking at it while there are nice and fancy and, and any Christian who might watch this or come across this video, they're going to go, well, why are you ignoring all the nice, pretty things that are said? Why are you? And that's the thing. You can go to any church on any Sunday and hear that mm -hmm. they're all, they're only going to talk about that. You're going to see gonna it. Yeah. You're going to see it in the stained glass, <clears throat> in the hymns, in the ritual. Um, but in terms of the preacher getting up on a Sunday morning and say, I want you to read <clears throat> Luke 14, 26. You have to hate your family to be a disciple. They're not going to do that. These, these 292 <clears throat> texts, verses that I list on my website. <clears throat> sorry. Those don't get a lot of traffic from the pulpit. They don't get a lot of traffic in Sunday school. What they're trying to do is put the best possible face on what the Bible teaches. And by the way, the classic example of this is the story of Noah and the flood. Um, how does it end up being depicted in children's books? Cute animals going onto the ark, the rainbow. I'm sorry, folks, this is genocide. God decided to kill everybody on earth except Noah and his family. This is a horrible, horrible story. Stories like this lead people to say, I've had enough, I'm walking away. And that's why the title of my article this morning. Maybe Jesus himself can talk you out of being a Christian. Uh, it's just, you know, read the texts carefully, read them critically, read them with an honest, open mind. If you want, go talk to your pastor about them, but be prepared for a, a canned answer. Or oh, God, God moves in mysterious ways. Yeah. Or to be um, completely coerced in a sense uh, psychologically into ignoring the doubts don't listen to this don't look at it that way kind of stuff and um yeah it makes me wonder you know i was recently hosting or helping with the debate between bart airman and mike lacona on the seven hour debate and oh. um i interviewed mike too but i talked to him and and i think in the debate he mentioned that he had doubts at one point of the is this true and he said that he went to Gary Habermas, Christian hmm. apologist. He went to his Christian brothers and sisters to get counsel for this issue because mm -hmm. they have a system. That's the thing. That's I mean, there's encouragement even in the New Testament. Go and try to convince your brother. And James even encourages this in the epistle of James to convince your brother of his wrongs and whatnot, to keep them in the faith or whatnot. The only place I know where they cast him out is the one guy who's sleeping with his mother in Paul's letter. And he's like, ah, you know, listen, uh, throw him out. It's better that his flesh is destroyed. So his spirit is preserved. <laughs> right. Uh, re really weird stuff going on, but he went to these people that I'm almost certain are not going to let him just freely think openly about these things, but are going to try to emotionally psychologically convince him to not leave, to not go away. Well, that's the job of the apologist. That's yeah, their professional. The pastor, right? <clears throat> that's their professional obligation. They are all paid propagandists for their particular Christian brand. They're not going to send him to a Catholic apologist. 
they're not going to send it to a Mormon apologist or a Jewish or a Muslim apologist. They're going to send them to the narrow range of Christians who believe the way they, you know, have a common belief in what belief in Jesus Christ is all about. Mm. This is too much fun. fun. Okay. So give me everything chapter. Did we, did we, I mean, this kind of goes into some of the stuff we've already talked about. What was going on in give me everything. By the way, just so everybody knows there's 311 people watching, hit the like button, check out his book. You got to get his book anyway. Um, well, this goes back to the example in Acts 5. You're supposed to give everything to the church. Um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, all, all, all. Um, this is, again, this is called fanaticism. Um, that's what cults want. They, they want total devotion. Let me ask, can I ask you a question? This is personal because I always thought I was crazy. I really (laughs) did. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like I wrestled with addiction in my life. I wrestled with lust, right? Uh, Pornography, you name it, like in my personal life. And I'm very transparent. I tell people, because maybe it'll help someone realize some of these things are natural, normal, and they aren't moral issues that these are more, things that we as humans can't help sometimes, or or it might even be a disease, for example, with my issue with addiction. Um, But I was so extreme about Christianity and thought the end was near and harassed my family every time I had the chance. There wasn't a conversation that came up that I didn't talk about Jesus. And I'm wanting you to answer me. I have my own personal answer on this, but I feel like I was being way more true to the message of what the Bible was actually saying than every Christian around me. And the Christians were thinking, you're, you're nuts. You're not really being a, this is not Christianity. How would you, if you were to psychoanalyze the situation here, was I being faithful to, to my master or not? I mean, if I was actually trying my best to follow along some of these crazy ideas that we're talking about today, wouldn't you say that person's more like Jesus than the rest of the world? Well, you have <laughs> you have the ideal Jesus of the imagination that is promoted from the pulpit, <clears throat> but then you have the Jesus that actually emerges from these very negative sayings. And you do have a choice. Which Jesus do you want to follow? Or do you just say, to hell with it all? It doesn't make sense. It's too incoherent. There's other ways to make your way in the world. There's other... How would we be moral without God? I sometimes hear. <clears throat> Put it, do a Google search for ethical, secular, secular ethics and see the huge list of secular ethicists who have been talking about how to be moral for centuries without any grounding in, in the divine or in God. We humans are good at that, at working out What's the best moral course to take without looking to the sky and say, oh, I need your help. The mystery to me is the the adulation given to the Ten Commandments. The first two or three are about how great God is. There's no prohibition of war, no prohibition of slavery, no prohibition of misogyny, if, if this was God's golden opportunity to give wonderful laws to Moses, he screwed up badly. He really did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Appreciate that. Yeah, I was definitely trying to be <laughs> trying to be as faithful to what I was reading and then finding out I was getting I was getting harassed by my my brothers in the faith. And they would say, because I would ch- I would change my doctrines as I studied more, and they'd go, "You're to and fro with the wind, like you're not grounded." And I'm thinking, "You've been a Baptist since you were born. You don't even know what a Catholic believes. You don't even really know. I mean, you have your idea, 
that they're pagan and they're evil and they're Satanist and you know, you name it like weird conspiracy theories within pro, uh, Protestant versions of looking at Catholicism, etc. My point is, I really wanted to give a fair shake of what the Bible's teaching and wanted to get to that because that was my presupposition that the Bible's true. So I would shift with evidence and find my way to get there. And I'd get attacked by my own Christians. In fact, they're the most volatile toward each other. If you go and watch some of the Christians online, <clears throat> they attack each other. They're cannibalizing themselves. And I was just trying to be faithful. And one day I had enough. I don't that's, know. Why, that's why you end up with... Uh... <clears throat> what is it? 30,000 different Christian sects, denominations, factions, divisions, splits. Because Christians can't agree with who, each other. Try to get a Baptist, Southern Baptist and a Catholic to agree on God and what God wants. <clears throat> this is a challenge I issued a long time ago in one of my articles. Select a thousand of the most devout Theists you can find. They're, these theists are famous for their prayer experiences. They have huge reputations in their own communities. But you got to have a Southern Baptist, you got to have a Mormon, you got to have a Catholic, you got to have a Muslim, you got to have a Jew, you got to have a lot of these. Get a thousand of them. And then say, okay, we want you to go into prayer, intense prayer mode with a list of questions. Was Jesus the son of God? Was he resurrected from the dead? How does God want to be worshipped? Are women supposed to drive? Is slavery okay? Now, unless these thousand intense prayers come out of their experience, and their answers are unanimous on all of these issues, you know we're being we're being played. We're being you know that their their intense prayer experiences are not authentic. <clears throat> They're talking to themselves. Hmm. They don't have a channel to God. Who's the famous uh, uh, philosopher? I think it was who said if horses could draw an image of their God, it would be horses. If it was donkeys, donkeys, monkeys, monkeys, dogs, dogs, the image of their God would be a reflection of themselves. And I can't remember the name of the philosopher, but. Yeah, but there's, then there's the whole issue of, okay, these thoughts are going inside your head. Explain to me the mechanism, how thoughts going on inside your head, escape your skull and reach the creator of the universe. What's the mechanism by which that works? God knows our thoughts, so the Bible tells us. How does that work? It's, it's also an element of what I call um, monotheistic totalitarianism. Is that something you really want? Is, 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 that, is that something that actually happens? That, that the God of the cosmos, who has billions of of galaxies under management is tracking the thoughts of 7 billion human beings in order to get even with those who don't think the right thoughts. <clears throat> <laughs> and I, I, the one example I use in my other book is uh, at any given moment, there must be millions of masturbating boys. Is God keeping track of that? And is he keeping keeping track? Is it worse if they're if, if these if these masturbating boys are thinking about other boys instead of girls? Does uh, does God do, do those boys earn more demerits from God? I mean, it's a mind-boggling thought that the Creator of the universe is paying attention so closely to every human being. Uh, the thing I keep asking for, where is the reliable, verifiable, objective data to show that that is the case? Mm. I say to Theus, tell us where we can find objective, reliable, verifiable data to back up your claims about God. 
tell us where we can find that data. Oh, well, in the Bible. No, 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 no. Muslims will not say that the Bible is, is that source. Mormons will tell you it's the Book of Mormon. Oh, will we all worship the same God? Really? Then the Bible should be opened up. Include the Quran. Include the Book of Mormon. Right between the two testaments. Why not? If you really believe that. There's too much incoherence in all the claims that theists of all varieties make about God. It's a mess. Thank you. A couple, <laughs> super, ch couple super chats, and then we're going to finish on number five. Uh, DBR, thank you for the super sticker. Really appreciate the support. Good to see you here. Jake K, I really appreciate the support. Thank you for having David on, Derek. And thank you, David, for, for the great work. If you haven't read his book, I'm telling you it's on Audible. Seth Andrews reads it. He's got it on paperback, hardback, all of that, all in the links of this video. It is so fun, and it's not long. Like You can get through it in a few hours if you speed up the reading, of course, on Audible, um, but probably a four-hour, five-hour read. It's that good. All right, last one. Remarrying after divorce is adultery. We might as well end on that. So oh, that's, uh, that's one of the most harmful things that Jesus taught. First part is uh, God created the male and female. Got no problem with that. If you believe there's a creator, if you believe the human race is meant to propagate, God created male and female, they get together, they become one flesh. Nothing wrong with that, if you're a theist. But then he adds those few words, which are horrible. Those whom God has joined together, let no one put asunder. The theology there, again, it's monotheistic terror, uh, um, monotheistic totalitarianism. Are we really expected to believe that God has engineered every single marriage that has happened since men and women began getting married? How many people get married for the wrong reasons? Yet God created all those unions. He had his hand in, in forging all those unions. It's bad theology. It really is. It's terrible theology. And how much damage has that caused? And by the way, for the people who say, oh, what would Jesus do? They go ahead and get divorced as much as anybody else does. They just ignore this teaching of Jesus. It's unrealistic. It's not practical. And of course, the whole other issue is, who knows if it did come from Jesus? We have no way of verifying that. But it's and a terrible it, teaching. I even hear that Paul disagrees with the teaching we find that comes from Jesus in the Gospels, that Paul himself has a different take on it. So even Paul seems to not be able to quite line up with the teaching that supposedly comes from the mouth of Jesus about marriage. Um Real quick, we are Myth Vision. Richard Thrasher, thank you so much for the support, my friend. Always good to see someone in the chat who's supportive and liking the videos and things like that. And, of course, uh, making this channel keep going like you are right now. I wanted to show an interview I'm doing coming up it's next Monday with a New Testament academic, of course. Uh, this is Jennifer Bird on marriage in the Bible. And we titled it, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> so she actually is going to be approaching this and giving you what, what is marriage in the Bible? You know, cause we have an idea and a conception today that it may not even reflect what was being meant by it mm -hmm. in its cultural context. So we're going to get down to the, what did it mean when it was instituted? I what mean, did it mean I back in those days? So yeah, looking forward to it. So anything else about remarrying after divorce is adultery. I mean, I know Jesus has this thing about the seven brothers who, like when he's talking about the resurrection, like they, there's already this idea that your brother needs to go and be with the, like this poor girl. <laughs> you got to be with all seven brothers because uh, there's a Levite law. Jeez. It's got to suck. What if a couple of them uh, have stinky breath or, uh, you know, like... <laughs> Well, this comes back to a basic theological question. If you're talking about the afterlife, how do you know? 
theologians have excelled for millennia making things up. Show me the reliable, verifiable, objective data about afterlife. Doesn't exist. It's all speculation. It's all wishful thinking. Got to have an afterlife because we've got to have people punished for the bad things they've done. Hmm. <laughs> it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to swallow because we all want, you know, things to carry on. We all want things to keep going or we don't want the party to end, hmm. you know. Uh, but yeah, that's been the hardest thing to deal with was like, well, then w what's the point? You know, that existential crisis you end up in, in your mind, but let's, let's to be continued this episode, because we okay. went five examples in of your 10 example book. And you really give two additionals, the bonuses, um, we're ending at remarrying after divorce is adultery. Our next one will, will continue on is you are accountable for every word. So mm -hmm. you're going to want to stay tuned. I definitely hope everybody goes check out our Patreon here at myth vision work very hard at what I do. If you haven't joined, you can message me as well. Private message me there. I am going to be publishing another video either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, this is on the evolution of Greek mythology. And um, also I've got other works coming soon. I plan on doing go get his book. 10 things Christian wish Jesus hadn't taught and other reasons to question his words. Would you like to comment about your book real quick as we're leaving just so the 330 something people can uh, really consider getting it? Well, the, uh, in my 2016 book, chapter 11, the 10 tough problems in Christian thought and belief chapter nine was in fact about the bad things Jesus taught. And so this book grew out of that chapter. Um, I, you know, I, I just said to myself, there's so much more to be said about the negatives about Jesus that are in full view in the gospel. They're there. They're obvious. If you read the Bible, mm -hmm. if you study it, if you're curious, if you inquire, if you if you really dig and want to know. Um, so I'm very pleased, by the way, that the book has been published, was published last August. And now there are, I think, 132 Amazon reviews something like 75% of them are um, um, five star. So I'm happy with that. Wow. You're not coercing people with everlasting damnation to write a positive <laughs> review. Wow. <That's, laughs> I'm proud of you for that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> he has a uh, website links down in the description as well. Um, and he has a YouTube channel. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Go show Dr. Madison some love. <laughs> He's on Amazon, a couple books there. I just showed you both of them are up there on Amazon. Go get you a copy. If not at his website, of course, you can purchase it through the website as well. It's just going to refer you over to Amazon so you can get it there. Um, debunking Christianity, we talked about earlier, John Loftus website. So there's, there's just so much you guys can do. Everybody can help support in that way. Any final words you'd like to say to our audience out there that's uh, just enjoying this Friday that is one of the most holy times of the year? <clears throat> you and me have blasphemed so bad today. I just... Uh. Um, what was it somebody said on Facebook, a meme? Uh, every, for atheists, every Friday is a good Friday and nobody has to die. Um, <laughs> no, I just appreciate very much you giving me this platform to explain the book and talk about it and uh, try to get the word out there that Christians need to look seriously at their own scripture and see the implications. Yeah. Snap out of it. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough spot, right? I don't try to force everybody uh, to think like me. You don't need to draw my conclusions. Um, I know some very more progressive Christians who draw lines. They just like the community or whatever it might be in particular that draws them to it. But if you're going to take this seriously and you're the kind of person who's nutty like me, nutty enough to want to really get to the bottom of what really was said and meant, et cetera, you're going to run into this problem. And what you do with it, I hope you make a better decision than what I did for many years in harassing my family with these teachings. So uh, whatever position you're at, I love you. Uh, you're another human like me. And I know that it's hard. We're all in different levels of our life. But I think that what Dr. Madison's trying to do today is exactly what I try to do, and that's try to help people see the harms in these things and to not follow those things. Don't believe in these harmful ideas. So 
I thank you. I, I hope you. Yeah, I love the book. I want to continue this lecture. Many people in the chat have loved what you said today. And I hope to have you back soon so we can continue. I'm here. Thank, thank you, you sir. so much. Okay. Yes. And ladies and gentlemen, never forget, we are Myth Vision. Enjoy your Friday. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.